When I was around seven and eight, I was sexually abused by a family friend. And at the time, I didn't know like what was happening or that it was necessarily abuse. Uh, I didn't have a name for it, but I know it didn't feel good. I just remember the bribery and also the threats to harm my family. And obviously, you know, when you're stuck between those things, you don't want to say anything. And like I said, even though I wasn't feeling comfortable about it, I, you know, still just didn't say anything. He would like touch me inappropriately. It would be times where he had me lay down with him and touch me in different places in my private areas. And I don't know, I just kind of froze. Like I didn't really say much. I just knew it felt uncomfortable. He was very strategic. I would say it happened pretty often in the beginning because it would be times where we would be home by ourselves. My mom wasn't around. She would be doing different things, working or whatever. So I just felt like he was strategic with that. Like he knew the times to do that. And at the time, I also didn't know that he was also alienating my sisters. So I actually remember this pretty clearly, like it was yesterday. One day I was sitting in the, like I was in the room and he turned off the light. We had like a bed on the floor and then he he told me to lay down. So he got behind me and like I was in front of him and he like unbuckled his pants and he was just like touching me. And then I immediately felt hot over my body. Like I was like, whoa, like obviously for me, he was showing signs where he was doing things here and there but he turned off the light and it would be times where I would try to get up cause like my other siblings were in the room. I had an older brother, he was like some years older than me. So I guess in that case he was responsible for us. Um, and he was a teenager at the time. I tried to get up and like get somebody's attention, but he kind of pulled me down and just told me like, it's okay, just stay with me type thing. And I felt super weird about it. But like it was, it just mainly started with like the touching. I freeze, like that was my first reaction. And like I said, my body was hot, but then eventually like one of my siblings came in and like barges in the room and it was like dark. And that was kind of like, oh, this is my like escape to go. And obviously like my sibling couldn't necessarily save me, but I felt like that was a moment where it was kind of like a distraction because I was alienated. Like he didn't abuse me around other people, if that makes sense. Or like not my sibling, not my, guardian at the time. So when I was by myself, it was easy to do those things. And so when my sibling came in the room um, in the dark, I don't think they knew anybody was in the room at first, but when they came in the dark, I was like, oh yes, like this is my time to just like go, like get up and go. I just felt super gross. Like I just felt bad. I felt guilty. Me personally, I was super stressed and anxious because he was just roaming around and me at elementary school, like, you know, cause I was, I walked to elementary school. My school was literally down up the street like some blocks away and so we don't know what area he's in if he's roaming around and it was just i don't know it was very intense it was a very intense probably 48 hours until he was found and called so before we went back to school they told us that was a possibility that we would have to go to a child advocacy center so we're at school we we go to school and then we're called home early and then we're taken to this advocacy center and they asked us different questions about like what was done to us and I don't remember anything after that but um, I know we had an open case for some time where case managers and stuff followed up with us and asked those questions and they gave us resources in the community and stuff like that. The family friend he actually admitted to his guilt so it was another thing where our family was likely gonna to have to go to trial, but because he just pleaded guilty, then it wasn't. My stepdad, he introduced the family friend to us. So that's where it gets twisted. And at first, like my stepdad, it, I felt like it was a, it was okay relationship. It was a decent relationship, right? Like he felt like my dad. And then, you know, after the family friend kind of got out the picture, then my stepdad, he started abusing us until he got sick. Well, my stepdad, he would do things like, you know, I would be sitting on his lap. He would like pick me up at night out the bed and just like sit me on his lap. And at the time, you know, I just knew that was weird. Like I was like, I'm asleep. Like, why are you picking me up? So the times I knew for sure it was my stepdad was, I would say between seven 
and ate, but I would say it was like an alternation. They didn't do it at the same time. And I would say it was more so when a family friend left. After a while, he was actually diagnosed with liver cancer. And I feel like that was kind of like what saved me from it going to penetration, I guess. I don't know. He also was an alcoholic and he eventually passed away from that. But I feel like in a twisted way, that's kind of what saved, saved us a little because when he was drunk, he became somebody else. Um, but I just feel like, you know, when he wasn't drunk, he was just like this nice guy and he did seem like a dad and it was just very confusing for me but I guess on the times where he was drunk and stuff he would just like sit me on his lap and it was uncomfortable because you could tell he was like aroused or whatever and I remember for that personally that's where it got to like he was just kind of like just sitting me in his private areas but it didn't necessarily go to anything further the abuse that i endured i struggled growing up like i guess i had felt like i was always used for somebody's pleasure in school i never felt like i fit in i always felt like maybe i can put it on like what happened to me and for that instant gratification i just you know, resorted to self-injurious behaviors because that's kind of how it validated me already feeling like I was a pack of damaged goods and already feeling like I'm just, I don't know, I, I just had this like chronic sense of numbness, even my classmates, like I just felt like I just never fit in. And so I just had this like sense of just wanting to hurt myself because I just like felt terrible about myself you know at first it started with just like like banging my head like literally punching myself in the lip and i know that probably might sound like crazy or wild to other people but like you know at those times i just did everything i could to just to hurt myself in the sixth grade i would write these i guess rather dark letters my teacher she grew con more concerned about me it was one time i actually left my journal on the table like in my uh classroom and then she like looked through it which i kind of felt like that was a breach of privacy if you ask me but in a sense i guess she kind of that's when things kind of unfolded and she started realizing well she needs help but i would just like say things that i wanted done to myself and things that i wanted to do to myself because i felt like i deserved certain pain so it started with the thoughts of like wanting to do things to myself and from those thoughts it went to me just like hitting my head or punching myself in the lip to like, you know, break skin. And then, you know, eventually during the middle school years, which was seven and eighth grade, I went to like knives. I actually took a, a knife up to my skin. And then, you know, I started wanting to like break skin on my arm because, you know, I just was like, okay, let's, let's try with this. Um, because the things that I was doing, just the thoughts, and then the little things I was doing, it just didn't seem like it could give me that fix as it was. And so it just kind of progressed to that. And then I guess as the knives felt more dual, I progressed into razors and glass. And so it went from thoughts to small actions, to knives, to razors, and then 24 seven. It became a 24 seven thing, like an addiction. My addiction to self harm and just that need for the instant gratification that I got from it, just that sense of wanting to feel alive. Like it would be times where I would just be like in my room and I would be like crouched down beside the bed and just like cutting my legs up. Now I remember one night in particular, I cut my legs and I still have a scar to today, uh, to this day. And uh, I cut my legs and it was just like dripping blood. And for me, that made me feel just like, the more blood I saw, I guess the more excited I was. And that might sound twisted to some, but for me, it just gave me that like validation. Oh, you're still alive. And then it would be times where I would be at school. Like one time in particular, I was in middle school and I was in the bathroom just crying my eyes out. I had just cut my arms up and I was just crying my eyes out. Girls was walking in and out, you know, using the bathroom, washing her hands, like walking in and out. And then it was this one girl in particular, she went to go get like my middle school um, teacher and then my teacher came in just to act like ask what was wrong with me and obviously like you know these were middle school girls but how nobody asked me what was wrong i guess i kind of wanted 
to be seen. But at the same time, I was scared to put myself out there because I was just scared to get rejected again. And then another story was when I was in high school, I was actually in a math class. And at that time I had just left the psych ward. Like I was under supervision, you could say a little. And my teacher was kind of looking out for me. You could tell she had anxiety, like she was on edge. It was one time I asked her, could I go to the restroom? I said, could I go to the restroom? And she was like, are you sure you're gonna be okay? Like, you know, are you sure you're gonna be okay? And she was like super nervous to just let me go to the bathroom by myself without anybody, like without any staff standing outside the hall because they knew like, I was really known for how much I self harm at the school or, you know, just how I self harm in general. Like, cause I had school counselors who knew me and you know, they sent me to the hospital and stuff like that. So she was really nervous because she got word from the school counselor, okay, like, you know, Kanija's back in school, she's back in class. Like if you can watch her a little as much as you can, you have other kids. But so I went to the bathroom eventually, I convinced her enough to let me go to the bathroom. And so I went to the bathroom and I cut my arm up and I wrote lost, I carved lost in my arm. So I, I, I put it on top of my arm and then the inner part of my wrist, I just like slashed my arm. And then I had a long sleeve, so I, I tried to hide it, but it was so much blood that I was like getting on my sleeve part. And then I went back in the classroom and I guess I looked like too suspicious for her. And then she said, are you okay? Did you do anything? And that was like her first thing, like, you know, did you do anything? Um, and I was like, no. Nope no like i just was kind of like you know get off my back lady like no i didn't do anything and then eventually she like grabbed my arm because she was worried and how she just said i looked suspicious like she didn't believe me so i was she took me outside the classroom because she didn't i guess didn't want to make a big scene in front of other kids and then she saw my arm and she said like she just her mouth just like got so wide like she was just like oh my gosh like she felt horrible that she let me go to the bathroom and i did that to myself and i let her know that wasn't her fault this is this is what makes me feel good and she didn't understand it but just that one time that she actually trusted me to go to the bathroom like i did that to myself and obviously i did feel guilty because she was a nice woman but like you know i just felt like the addiction was so strong for me so the tom in high school that it became known that I that I self harm was initially I confided in the school counselor because I was having like these thoughts to self harm more and more. Um, and then I showed him my wrist and it would be times where him and I would meet and I would just like be like, okay, I'm fine, you know? And then it would be the next time it would be kind of like a cycle of like, I would feel like that was a temporary resolve or somehow because I talked about it. And then, you know, I would go home because my thoughts got the best of me. I would go home and then I would cut myself again. And then it would be like another time where I would be in his office. And he realized that obviously this was a recurring thing after a while, like he saw more of me. And then, I mean, it would be times where I would have to go to the nurse to get my um, scars and my wounds bandaged up because it would just be like open and that wasn't safe, I guess, at school. So in the psych hospital, I had quite a few admissions my very first admission i got there and i was terrified because you know i i've seen movies where psych wards weren't necessarily um in the best light they didn't necessarily put psych wards in the best light and so i was terrified of what that experience might be for me because i didn't know like that was my first time ever in a facility like that and so I went to the adolescent unit and they they did the body check and all of that. They documented the scars that I already had and stuff. And my stay in the psych ward, it was very unnerving, but I guess I found people my age that I could relate to like, you know, wow, like it's people in this position and it's, it's girls actually going through this. I thought I was the only one that would go through self harm. I, mean, I even met a girl in there that she would burn herself. You know, I explored with burning, but she would actually burn herself like to self harm. And so it would just be like a lot of that, like other girls self harm and they're also dealing with depression and stuff. That was also the first time where I had, I have taken medicine where I actually got diagnosed with clinical depression and I had taken medicine for it. I don't know, I was, I was nervous, but I would say my first experience, uh, I was there for about 12 days. Um, and I, I did meet other people, other girls that I related to. And I guess that was comforting for me, but on the other side, I 
literally left for not even a full day and I was sent back again because I ended up self-harming. I experienced bullying, like a, a, a memory that sticks in my mind is when I was in high school and there was a girl, like I was walking in the hallway and she just asked like, aren't you the girl that cuts herself? You know, like she was wondering and I, I don't know if it was like people talking about it around the school, um, but I mean, during that time, it is a lot of rumors that get passed around and I froze because I'm like, I, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I cut myself, but like, I don't know. I guess it was just like so in my face. Um, and then she kind of walked off with her other friend, like giggling. And I kind of felt like, what was the point of that? Like, it was just like, were you trying to embarrass me? Like, were you trying to like, just be a mean girl? Like, I didn't understand that. And then I would also get like, um, comments online and stuff. Cause it was one time I actually wore a dress. I have cuts on my leg. So it was one time I actually wore a dress. Like this is the time that I actually gathered the confidence to do it after all my scars had healed, of course. And this was one time I actually gathered the confidence to wear a, a dress or it was like a skirt dress, whatever. But I know it was like revealing a part of my legs, like uh, like my thighs or whatever, and a part of my legs. And so I did, you know, the parts that were showing, it was scars. And then, you know, I had comments like, oh, did she get whipped? Like, did she get whipped? Oh, those are tiger scratches. Like those are tiger scars or, you know, tiger stripes, Edward Silzer hands. Like it would just be like so many comments like that where they would like make comments about that. I mean, and obviously that that's painful because like if only they knew where these came from, you know, like, and obviously like it was just exhausting. I didn't want to say like, tell every single time, or use that emotional energy to like tell my story or whatever. But um, it would just suck just to see the heartlessness and not them not having more compassion about it. And, and even if they didn't know or they don't understand it, just like still talking about me and like making these comments and these jokes, especially when I had gathered the carriage to wear something short. My attempts to take my life initially started with really just hoping to cut a vein too deep. Um, it would be times where I would like bleed profusely and I would just be thinking like okay that's the end um it was it was a time where you know when I when I had cut my legs open I was so dizzy like I was just sitting up against the wall like it, I just didn't have any energy to even stand up like I, I just didn't have any energy and so it would be times where I would just hope that I I nicked a vein and that I cut it I cut it deep enough and then that would just be the end of me um and then you know it progressed i went to pills where i would try to take as many of those or even take things that wasn't even prescribed to me like take take things that wasn't mine or you know just anything that i would see like it, i i didn't necessarily even read the name it would just be like anything i would see i, I remember in one in one instance i actually tried to overdose on tolanol and let me just say that wasn't a pleasant experience because my stomach i mean that was horrible like my my chest was in so much pain my stomach was in so much pain and i think it was just like all a medicine it was a horrible way to go for me and i'm like that's not something i want to do but it was mainly just like wanting to cut my vein too deep and then that's it the turning point for me was i was literally in my room like i had just actually got out the psych ward yet again and i was thinking about like I don't, like this is a miserable way to live my life you know like i met these other girls like other teenagers other girls who's also going going through these things so i now know it can't just be me right and so that's when i decided like i wanted to start a movement i wanted to start something and then that's when i looked at the different animals and then i looked at their different qualities and traits and then i came up with the with the cheetah how they're determined and how they uh persevere through the different challenges right and they're like super fast runners and so i was just kind of relating that to my life how you know even even when life has tried to knock me down i still just managed to keep going even no matter how many cuts i've had on my body no matter how many times I've harmed my system, I still stood and I still woke up every single day. So that was that was a sign that was something, right? The cheetahs just stuck with me. And then I came up with the acronym Cheetah. Um, and so my now movement, Cheetah, Cheetah Movement, and it stands for confidence, harmony, enlightenment, encouragement, tranquility, awareness, and hope. And I came up with this idea of, to help others feel less alone and just also bring awareness to self-harm and suicide prevention. 
Now I am currently 21 years old. I could have never imagined that my life will be as fruitful and beautiful as it is now. And obviously there are struggles in life like any other thing, right? Like any anybody has struggles, everybody has struggles. But I would say I am currently a first gen student, honor student in college. I just recently got married this summer, July 22nd to the absolute best man. And it, it's he's also an example like, Men can be kind, not all men abuse, and he's very gentle. And I mean, we just mesh really well for just the trauma I've been through. And he and he really helps me to love myself. And obviously I have that foundation, but he helps me to really love myself. The advice that I would give to someone going through a tough time right now is just to reach out. That's one thing I didn't really understand at that time. Like, oh, nobody would really care. You know, like that was kind of my thought process. Nobody would really care about like what I'm going through. People have their own things, but like the experiences that I've had in my life and just my, like all the examples and all the support throughout time, I've truly seen that people are there to help. Like people genuinely do want to help. And it's about reaching out. Like people would rather hear you vent for hours and instead of planning your funeral, right? Like when you put things like that in that type of perspective, I'm like people genuinely do care.